Hello and welcome to this special history and policy seminar from the Mile End Institute on the 40th anniversary of the 1981 budget. We are delighted that you can join us this evening for what promises to be a fascinating and insightful event. My name is Dr Emma Barrett. I'm an honorary research fellow at the University of Birmingham and visiting research fellow at the Mile End Institute. To briefly introduce ourselves, the Mile End Institute is a non-partisan organisation founded by the distinguished historian Lord Hennessy at Queen Mary University of London. It connects academics with policymakers and the public to throw light on the great issues of our time. We host regular online panels, events and talks, and we also run a lively podcast series on a variety of policy and political themes. To find out more about future events and catch up with past ones, you can head over to our website and sign up to our mailing list. It was easy to miss given the coronavirus crisis, but March this year marked the 40th anniversary of the 1981 UK budget statement, one of the most controversial in British political and economic history. Geoffrey Howe, the Conservative Chancellor in Margaret Thatcher's first government, deliberately increased taxes during a world recession. This came two years after an experiment in monetarism involving tight monetary policy and punishingly high interest rates to tame the high inflation of the 1970s. Inflation dropped and the recession soon bottomed out, allowing the Thatcher government to begin its pivotal privatizations and financial deregulations that marked the decade's politics. The budget has become a foundational moment in popular memories of Thatcherism. It also accelerated ongoing deindustrialization and spiraling unemployment and was attacked by not just the Labour Party and left, but parts of Thatcher's own party and by much of the academic economic establishment. The actual significance of the budget in shaping 1980s Britain is also a source of controversy among historians. 40 years on, the current Conservative government is at a new fork in the road in its economic policy, grappling with pandemic spending legacies, the fallout from Brexit in 2008, and with electoral pledges both to fiscal probity and to level up the UK. Are there any lessons from the 1981 budget and the 1980s generally for the government and for us today? To discuss this, we are delighted to be joined by a stellar panel. Our first speaker is Professor Tim Congdon, the founder and chair of the International Institute of Monetary Research and fellow of the Institute of Economic Affairs. In the 1980s, Tim was a leading commentator from the City of London, and in the 1990s, he sat on an expert advisory panel to the Treasury. Our second speaker is Jim Tomlinson, Professor of Economic and Social History at the University of Glasgow. He has written several books on the economic history of modern Britain and the politics of economics, and is currently working on deindustrialization in modern Britain and the global history of the jute industry. Our third speaker is Dr. Amy Edwards, a lecturer in modern British history at the University of Bristol. Her research focuses on cultures of capitalism investment and enterprise, their interactions with civil society and the political economy, and their impact on everyday life. And our final speaker is Wukach Krebel, economic researcher at the New Economic Foundation. Wukach focuses most of his work on contemporary monetary and fiscal policy. So thank you all for joining us this evening. In terms of format, each of the panellists will speak for about eight minutes in the order I introduced them. I will then open the discussion up to questions from the floor. Please do try to keep to the eight minutes as we want plenty of time for questions. We'll finish by eight o'clock. And in the audience, if you have a question, please do put it in the chat box or use the Q&A function. So without further ado, let me hand over to Tim to kick off the panel. Hello. Um... Everyone, Emma, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I think I'll just fire away. Um, I think in understanding the 1981 budget, it's important to put it into context. And uh, of course, it was 
the second major budget of the uh, Thatcher government at that time, um, well, the first in the 1980s, it, it followed the 1970s. Now, in the 1970s, Britain had inflation peaking in August 1975 of over 27%. Um, the, this was followed uh, 1976 by a year in which the pound collapsed and uh, the government had to go to the IMF uh, for financial support in somewhat humiliating circumstances. The ratio of public debt to national income uh, had been rising through the 1970s and the lack of confidence in British financial policy was such that the interest payments on these debt on, on the debts kept on rising year by year. And um, I was actually at the time working um, in the uh, government bond department of a stockbroking firm. And um, so you had this, if any bad mistakes came through in government policy, bond yields would rise, and that would then raise the cost of servicing the debt. You might say, well, so what? Well, governments have to raise taxes to uh, cover, cover their expenditure, and sometimes it's difficult to raise the taxes. So if the expenditure consists to a large extent of interest on public debt and a growing extent on public debt, it may be that spending on schools, hospitals, and so on has to be cut simply to deal with the debt interest problem. Um, of course, extreme form of that was in Greece um, five or six years ago, um, when in fact, um, not only was the cuts in spending on health and education to deal with the ballooning debt interest problems that they had, there's also 25% fall in GDP. Now, as a, an economist working in the city in the 1970s, seeing all these things going on, I wanted to stop these processes. And so I advocated a policy of gradual reductions in the rate of growth, the quantity of money to reduce inflation and associated reductions in the ratio of public debt, sorry, budget deficit to GDP to keep the uh, public debt under control. Now what happened, things didn't go to plan. Well, what happened in, 1979 and 80 was that um, money growth was too high, interest rates were raised, uh, the pound rose strongly on the foreign exchange, it was reversing that fall in 1976, and there was a recession. The, in 19, early 81, government decided that, nevertheless, the targets for the budget deficit reduction relative to GDP should be maintained. And that was the background to the decisions taken in the 1981 budget. There's an awful lot to say about what happened in those years. Um, let me just make a couple of points. The first point is that the recession actually didn't reach its, its trough immediately after the budget, but it was only from the, the worst of the recession actually was over by the time the budget measures were announced, they were not responsible for the severity of the recession from say mid 79 to early 81. The trough in output relative to trend came a couple of years later, but there was roughly trend growth in much of 82. The, then uh, thereafter, there was in fact a pretty much sustained recovery, distorted of course by the miners strike in 1984. And may I just emphasize here, if you're worried about jobs, that the growth in employment in the decade from 1981 was greater than that in the previous decade. There was such a big recovery in employment in the late 80s that in fact, overall, there was a rise in employment larger than in the previous decade. It's all part of trying to solve the long run problems facing the British economy so that the um, dealing with the financial aspects was part of a wider agenda of dealing with supply side reforms and, and so on. I think the other point I would make is that the agenda basically worked. Look, I'm not disputing that there was a severe recession in the early 80s, clearly there was, um, but um, if one looks over the whole period of say 
20 years that followed 1981, the Britain did restore its international financial respectability, inflation did come down, and it was the sort of measures carried out in 1981 that then were the background to the period of stability that we had, the so-called great moderation uh, in the 15 years, 2007, 2008, and the Great Recession. Um, the, the, those years were called the nice years, um, the uh, non-inflationary, consistently expansionary years um, in the, um, from 1992 through to 2007. So I would say that um, despite all of the controversy and so on associated with the 1981 budget, that it was, a, it was well designed, it was appropriate, and it was a success when put into the context of the wider program being pursued by the Thatcher government at the time. And I just say as a very young man, I did advocate the medium term financial strategy, which um, by the terms of which the tax increases were required to get us back onto the path of aimed at in the budget deficit GDP um, kind of trajectory that we was in the MTFS. Um, and um, I, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to defend what was done in that budget. Have I covered my eight minutes or so? I think I'm, right, I'm all right, I just about out there, Emma. Thank you very much, um, Tim. That's a that's a great start. I'm sure that uh, people will want to come back in due course. But shall we uh, shall we go to Jim? Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks very much for inviting me uh, to this um, event. Um, I too was around uh, in 1981 and remember uh, the budget. Um, it seemed at the time a very crucial shift in policy. I think 40 years later, I'm less convinced that it mattered as much uh, as we then believed. I perhaps also should say that uh, I was then a relatively young lecturer in economics, but I didn't sign the famous letter uh, because my uh, head of department was too idle to circulate it uh, to, his, uh, to his colleagues. I think that was his motive anyway. Um, anyway, obviously I agree with, with Tim entirely that one needs to put this in some kind of context, and obviously the context really is the inflation of the uh, 70s. Point I'd emphasize there is that that was not obviously just a British phenomenon. Uh, it was very general to much of the world. Uh, Britain had an inflation rate, which was roughly or perhaps slightly less than Italy. It was more than uh, uh, France. It was substantially more than Germany. But all of those countries saw pretty high inflation uh, in, the, in the 1970s. And obviously, from 1975 onwards, uh, the, 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 uh, the Labour government was, was trying to deal uh, with that uh, uh, in the context of obviously the breakup of Bretton Woods and floating exchange rates um, and the uh, OPEC uh, won the quadrupling um, of oil prices. And my summary of the 1970s, that is from 75 to 79, is that for all the uh, humiliations, and I accept that word that Tim used in relation to the whole IMF debacle, although I think lots of that is misunderstood, and the humiliations obviously of the winter discontent, that in, in one sense the Labour government had a degree of success in its policy. By the time it left, left office in 79, inflation was roughly half of its peak level, as between somewhere like between 12 and 15 percent. And more importantly, unemployment had not risen significantly uh, uh, over its period uh, uh, in office. Then the Conservatives come in, obviously, in 79. Um, and they bring obviously to bear something which, which was obviously commonly called monetarism. And clearly that's a, at one level a clear doctrine, uh, which Tim touched on, uh, the belief that uh, inflation is, is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon and that the only way of dealing with it successfully is to reduce the rate of monetary uh, growth. That's unambiguous. What I think is less clearly understood is that in terms of actually turning that into a policy framework, as Nigel Lawson says in his memoirs, little work had been done. Uh, so although there was a clear doctrinal position, a clear general posture, there was very little in the way of specific policies. So the medium term financial strategy was not something which they brought with them really. Uh, it's something which was largely made up in the first period of office and not announced until the 1980 budget. And of course, what followed 
Institute uh, from, from 1979 um, was it has to be said a shambles in terms of policy implementation. I and mean, if you read the public records, the uh, Treasury records, uh, Prem Prime Minister's records and so on, of 1980 and early 81, what you see is close to panic uh, amongst the uh, top people, the advisors, amongst the Prime Minister, the, the Chancellor and so on. Because clearly the medium term financial strategy is not working as I intended. Uh, monetary growth is far worse faster than was it was supposed to be. PSBR is growing far, uh, uh, is much larger than it's supposed to be. So the problem for the government is what to do uh, 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 about that in the context where, as Tim mentioned, there's a very sharp recession, which is driven uh, certainly immediately by the very rapid rise in the exchange rate, squeezing corporate profits, and that being the major driver of the immediate and huge increase in, in unemployment. So in the face of that, what, do the, what does the government do? Well, what it does actually is to uh, basically give up on really part of the medium-term financial strategy. Sam Britton, as many of you know, who was a broadly pro-government uh, 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 journalist on, on the Financial Times, wrote that in 1981, the government turned the policy from a medium-term financial strategy into a medium-term fiscal strategy. Because on monetary policy, of course, despite the rapid rise in, in sterling M3, beyond the target. They lowered interest rates, indeed, as early as July 1980, they lowered them. Then they lowered them again in November. Then they lowered them again, uh, obviously, to accompany the budget. So that what they moved to was, uh, what one can understand, uh, was absolutely politically necessary was to assert, you know, the lady's not for turning, we must, we can't change policy. Actually, uh, that meant that fiscal policy was stuck to very, very hard. And of course, that was what led to the introduction of the, um, uh, the tax increases, uh, largely, largely interestingly, of course, done through failing to index uh, the, the income tax. Uh, uh, threshold. That was the main way in which taxes uh, were, were uh, raised. So uh, my perception of the 1981 budget 40 years on is that it wasn't such a crucial turning point as I believe at the time, and as I think is often suggested, perhaps uh, uh, by people here, I don't know, uh, 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 today. Partly that's based on the fact that the way in which it's often discussed is a, is a sort of uh, uh, kind of shootout at the OK Corral between the sort of mainstream Keynesian economists and a few uh, pioneers of something different. But I don't think it's largely a, a debate about um, um, uh, economic uh, theory. Um, one of the interesting things, if the Institute the, the of Economic Affairs published a very interesting book about uh, the episode of focusing on the on the 364 economists. It's actually called "Were the 364 Economists Wrong?" And of course, the answer they say is, of course, yes. But it's a very interesting book. But one of the most interesting features of that book is if you go to the list of the signatories at the back, which is very helpful. It's provided in an appendix of the IEA book. It's also says there, accompanying the list, quotes, the signatories also include a number of recent IEA authors and present members of the IEA Academic Advisory Council, i.e. people who'd signed uh, the letter, came from a very wide range of theoretical positions, people who could plausibly, sensibly in the context of the time, be called monetarists because they just believe that the government was moving too quickly to slow down the, the rate of, of, of growth of, 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 of monetary demand, uh, and, and that, that was plainly having an excessive impact on the level um, of, of uh, 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 unemployment. Not all of the people who supported it were what Tim Compton has quite rightly, I think in some contexts, called naive Keynesians. They were not all Frank Hans and, and, and so on, who, who, who perhaps, uh, uh, whose real interests were not really anyway in, the, in, the, in the macro uh, economic uh, policy. So I would see this, um, the 1981 budget, as uh, not really an argument about theory, but an argument about the, the, the politics of prioritizing uh, uh, inflation over unemployment excessively, 
a, a, a budget which which was damaging uh, uh, in its effects. Not, and I here I agree entirely with Tim Conley, it didn't cause the recession. That's clearly not the case. The recession was already bottoming out at the time of the budget. Uh, but it certainly uh, led into a period when unemployment, of course, continued to rise. Um, I notice uh, Tim was careful to say that his measure was what happened to employment, uh, which rose as it did indeed. Uh, but if you look at the unemployment level, of course, that remained, uh, it actually increased down to 1986 and didn't return to its 1979 level to about 2000 or something like that. So the legacy in terms of unemployment, and we know now in retrospect how damaging much of that was, particularly in, in, in industrial areas of Britain and how long term uh, the damage uh, was without uh, any, it seems to me, clear benefit. So very summarily, I'm probably exceeding my time limit. I mean, my sense of this is not, as I say, the sort of shootout at the OK Corral where a decisive move was made in policy, but one unfortunate uh, staging post on the attempt to find a new macroeconomic framework uh, of trying to combine stable prices and relatively low unemployment, which had been fundamentally screwed up, particularly with the breakup of Bretton Woods in the 1970s and the, in the, and the coming into being of, 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 of um, uh, floating exchange rates. And it's really just a staging post towards uh, not, not, uh, not the sort of nirvana, because obviously we haven't reached there, uh, but towards the kind of regime which developed uh, 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 in the um, in the two thousand. So that's enough of me. Thank you. Jim, thank you. Um, thank you both for putting this into um, a really useful context for our for our discussions. Um, Amy, can I go to you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Emma. And thanks, Jim and Tim. Really um, interesting uh, thus far. Um, so I suppose I wanted to start with a bit of confession. Um, unlike my fellow panellists, I'm, I'm not an economist um, and uh, not even really, I suppose, an economic historian in the more traditional sense. Um, I'm someone who's very interested in the relationship between economic and political ideologies and everyday life. Um, so I suppose uh, if thus far we've had people um, contextualising the budget in different ways and kind of in relation to um, European economy, the global economy and other things, my, my contextualising effort as a historian is to place this in the context of the, the wider Thatcherite ideology and social reforms and economic reforms um, and thinking about those uh, as a broader package. Um, so to that end, I guess, rather than pull apart the 1981 budget in terms of um, the merits or failings of monetarism, I want to talk briefly about the wider cultural and social context that shaped the conception and implementation of key Thatcherite economic reforms like monetarism, but also privatization and deregulation, things like that. So I suppose I really just wanted to make um, two points or draw attention to two things. Uh, firstly, uh, I think it's really important to remind ourselves that Thatcher's policy making and that for governments was driven by a multitude of influences. I'm not saying that anyone here was suggesting otherwise, but um, I guess given our focus on the 81 budget, it's easy to conflate the entire political project of Thatcherism with um, an ideological and predominantly economic doctrine inspired by the writings of people like Hayek and Friedman. Um, but as many historians have shown, um, quote, Thatcherism was just as significantly shaped by ideas drawn from beyond think tanks and the workings of economic theorists. Uh, her political economy reflected really deeply held convictions about family-centered uh, individualism, um, tradi uh, traditional conservatism, Christian morality, notions of respectability, um, and all of these influences did have their part to play in the economic as well as the social changes that occurred under Thatcher's um, premiership. So um, just as one example, Frank, uh, Florence Sutcliffe Braithwaite, I believe, um, she's written really interesting stuff around um, Thatcher's housing policy and the extent to which kind of pretty bourgeois values derived from her childhood, um, infamously as a grocer's daughter, um, how that shaped the character of her reforms there, sometimes actively quite overriding seemingly key tenets of her free market ideology. So none of this really is to suggest, I guess, that the 81 budget and the, you know, very clearly monetarist principles upon which it was based were inconsequential, 
But when thinking about it in retrospect, I think it's important that we situate it not only with that kind of wider economic context that Jim and Tim have done so um, wonderfully for us, but also the wider political and social one too. Um, so I think for Thatcher, there was a fairly direct connection between her more um, quote like personal values and her economic outlook and fiscal reforms. Um, the latter didn't happen in a complete vacuum and her commitment to tackling inflation at the cost of unemployment um, was, for example, um, mediated and informed by her views about gender and the role of the nuclear family. Um, so Eliza Philby, um, again, has written um, a really great study of um, Thatcher's relationship to Methodism and um, talks about how Thatcher's perceived um, her concern about the rising numbers of working uh, mothers um, and perception of that as a social problem. Um, as something that was likely to be detrimental to family stability, um, that part of the cause of this problem, she believed, uh, was this high inflation and the recessions that had forced uh, mothers to go out to work. And she argued had decreased the imperative for fathers to work for reasonable wages or even to work at all. So this kind of logic laid the groundwork for a series of um, kind of panics centered on the notion of ill-behaved latchkey children, uh, high rates of divorce, and again, the latter, the Conservatives argue, could also be explained by the fact that women felt more comfortable leaving their husbands safe in the knowledge that state provided benefits and would act as a kind of safety net. So given this assumption that economic causes underpin the social moral decline, it seems unsurprising then that the Conservative Party proposed fiscal solutions that sought to encourage women to stay at home. So again, when we think about why um, that during the Conservative governments were so committed to certain kinds of um, policy options, some of this was also, this wasn't only drawing from their kind of quote unquote neoliberal outlook. Um, and this kind of brings us back to that really often cited Thatcher quote about economics being the method while the object was to change the soul. And I think that this was really more than just a catchy soundbite for, um, for the Conservative party. For Thatcher, it's the driving aim of policy was to battle um, moral decline as much as it was um, economic decline. And sometimes that complemented, but also conflicted uh, with the principle of e uh, free market economics. And so that connects to my second point, um, which is, I guess, a bit more tangential to the 1981 budget, if you can forgive me for that. Um, but I do think relevant for understanding the extent, but also limitations of the Thatcher right challenge in the 80s. Um, and in making this point, I want to draw a little more directly from my um, own research, which um, focuses on the rise of mass investment culture in the late 20th century and thinking about some of the stuff that happened subsequently. So um, the mass privatizations of the Thatcher era. Um, and so when I talk about mass investment culture, I'm talking about a new norm kind of characterized by a vastly expanded number of people with assets held in shares and also a widespread cultural engagement with the stock market by investors and non-investors alike. And I choose specifically to describe this evolving relationship between the British public and financial markets um, without adopting the language of the Conservative Party at the time um, who opted for popular capitalism. And I do that on purpose because I think it draws an important distinction between changes wrought by top-down political reform and kind of requisite social and cultural change um, that originated often beyond the corridors of Whitehall. So if we take that kind of most famous of that's right economic reforms privatization, it becomes clear that encouraging more people to become investors um, wasn't limited to the Conservative Party, nor was it limited to the 1980s, um, the kind of discursive and institutional networks that underpinned the phenomenon that the Conservative Party sought to claim as their own um, kind of their own generated popular capitalism took shape over the course, um, I would say, you know, like a century or more in many ways. Um, and again, that's not to say that the path of change was predetermined nor unaffected by privatization. It kind of opened the flood, floodgates to some of this. Um, but that the socio-cultural terrain upon which privatization took place had already formed by the time that Thatcher took office in 79. Um, and I can talk more about this if um, people want to ask questions after. But I suppose really the wider point that I want to make is that as part of this process, um, institutions and organizations external to the Conservative Party were really important, whether that was a financial press um, or financial institutions, um, very kind of keen to make use of the language of popular capitalism to pursue um, their own aims. Um, sometimes, again, they allied with the Conservative Party's um, political agenda. Sometimes they sat in slight contradiction. They were much less 
um, many financial institutions were much less keen on direct um, capital ownership in British um, companies um, compared to how some of the advertising for popular capitalism um, and for privatization uh, sought to encourage people to act. Um, and so I guess just to round up, this is a line of argument that I hope kind of connects to those made by people like uh, Christopher Bellringer and Ronald Mitchie who've sought to dispel that myth that either the government or the city approached issues like deregulation and pension reform with a really clear cut coordinated plan or clear ambitions. Um, and much the same as um, Jim's kind of arguing that Thatcherism wasn't necessarily this big coherent project um, that started off with a clear set of aims about what it was intended to achieve. Um, and yeah, we should just be cautious about too readily taking in those claims um, retrospectively that there was a, a great plan in place um, and that a lot of this was much more contingent um, and quite heavily influenced and shaped and limited and unleashed um, by institutions sitting outside the outside the government. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my two cents. Amy, thank you. That's um, that's really interesting. I'm looking forward to the questions um, um, on your uh, on your on your talk. Um, can we now go to Luke uh, Wukach and uh, for, for your um, take on the 1981 budget and lessons for today? Um, yeah, thanks, Emma. And thank you very much for having me here. And, and thanks for, to the other panelists for their very interesting and different uh, perspectives and insights on that uh, discussion. Uh, so my take, again, will be slightly different, I think, uh, than the others. Uh, so I will try to look at this from a bit of more contemporary perspective and maybe lessons for contemporary <clears throat> policy. Uh, and if you can even draw any from what happened like uh, all the time ago. Uh, so I think the good starting point is to compare like, you know, what the different environments were facing the chancellors back in 1981 for uh, Chancellor Howe and now for Chancellor Sunak uh, in his very recent budget. Uh, and they were quite different economic uh, environments. So uh, obviously, as previous panelists have highlighted, the challenge back then was inflation. Uh, was about 12 and a half percent coming in the budget, but as Tim highlighted, it was even higher, over 20 percent in preceding years. Whereas nowadays, we we had we just had a decade of very low inflation, just around two percent, and it only now started to pick up uh, after the COVID economic shock. But the, the forecast that, that seemed to be uh, pointing to it rising no more than about five percent in the UK. So it's quite a, a different world still, unless the forecast proved to be wrong. Um, in other things, so coming into the budget in 1981, the unemployment in the UK was uh, on the increase uh, from below 5% from most of the 1970s. It was about 6.8%. Uh, whereas now, uh, despite the COVID shock, despite this whole dislocation to the economy, we had the government response through the furlough program mainly that turned out to be pretty, pretty successful. And this massive fiscal intervention ended up saving a lot of jobs. And uh, while the unemployment was really low before this recession, 3.8%, it's not forecast to exceed 5%, uh, despite you know, all the uh, series of lockdowns and dislocation by pandemic. Uh, so we are not expecting after this crisis to have unemployment that was even as high as a statutory government had going into that budget and the unemployment then increased further. Uh, and it, maybe the, the last interesting aspect uh, from this very statistic is around, you know, the government expenditure and uh, debt and how much it all costs. Uh, so we can compare that the bank rate, so the official Bank of England trade on the lending, which is not quite the same as the government interest cost, but it's quite strongly correlated. Uh, so that period was a period of very high interest rates try, uh, used to try to squash this problem of inflation, so around 14% now. Uh, back then in 1981. Well, nowadays, I mean, interest rates are the record lows, just 0.1% uh, after the Bank of England has cut them further due to the COVID shock. So, I mean, the world of difference, like completely different monetary environment in, in that uh, respect. Uh, and yeah, coming to the, the, the issue of the government debt and costs of, of, of public policy. So the debt to GDP ratio, of which, I mean, I'm not a big fan because uh, it's a, a ratio used to argue for all sorts of things, but uh, without perhaps that much justification, but because it's a popular metric, I will cite it here. 
so it was around 42% uh, coming into that budget in 1981, and it's over 100% now. In, in, uh, well, mostly as a result first of the 2008 crisis, and as we knew like how much the government had to borrow to, uh, to bail out the banks, but I mean, the COVID crisis was even bigger impact, so the government had to borrow significantly. So again, the, the public debt as proportion of economies more than twice now. But interesting aspect of that is, so the debt servicing costs, how much it costs government on an annual basis to, 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 to service this debt. Uh, I, again, I think Tim highlighted before that it was a big problem in 1970s coming into 1980s. It was very high. Uh, I just look at some data showing it was around 4% of GDP, pretty big amount. Uh, however, now, despite the debt being more than twice as high, what the government pays is, is less than, than half of that in terms of uh, GDP. Uh, is something is forecast to be about just one point uh, half percent of, of GDP in the coming years, despite this massive increase in debt. So again, it shows that we, we live in a different environment. Uh, so where the, is this taking me? So I mean, yeah, the chancellors faced different challenges, and then they had to take different responses to deal with that. Uh, so as we know, uh, Chancellor Howe and uh, Prime Minister Thatcher opted to to tackle inflation as a main problem, and. Up to a point that they succeeded, inflation was reduced uh, to, to less than 5% in the middle 1980s. Although, as I know from, from my uh, degree studies, inflation came back to pretty much where it started under the Thatcher government. By 1990, it was back to about 10% after loss and boom. So the policy kind of had a rebound of, of how successful it was. But what happened in the meantime is that the impact on unemployment, so from the starting unemployment of 6.8%, it exceeded 10% and stayed there for a good chunk of, of the decade, and only towards the 1980s, which loss of books started to reduce. So it's a massive uh, cost in terms of, of, you know, one in 10 workers not being able to find a job. Whereas nowadays, the Polish response to COVID crisis, like, you know, as I said before, uh, shielded these jobs, and we don't expect to see unemployment uh, even as high as 5%. And I observed a peculiarity in, in this data that unemployment tended to be below 5% throughout 1970s, then uh, went above that level under Thatcher government. In fact, for the first time, it fell again below 5%, below the, the period that was throughout the entire conservative government. It was in 1997, just after Tony Blair came into power. So, I mean, we cannot credit him for something happening about a month or two, but it shows us that the scale of the impact of, of a touch of the economy, that the, uh, the rate of unemployment remained elevated and only, only took, well, decade and a half to, to reduce to the levels that were observed before. Um, and so in terms, yeah, of, of lessons for, for, for the current chancellor, uh, I think the main lesson is that, that you can reshape economy if you want to. If you have a strong objective, uh, you can do. I mean, we cannot deny that that uh, Thatcher government did reshape economy. Uh, there were some, you know, perhaps unintended consequences, a lot of consequences that many people would criticize in terms of what happened to British industry and so on. But I mean, they did succeed to, to, to push uh, a lot of what they wanted to do. Uh, and I think, you know, part of it was the, the strong monetary fiscal uh, coordination uh, at that time. Like 1981 budget is an interesting example. So it's very well remembered for this increase of taxes by Chancellor Jeffrey Howe uh, in the middle of recession, which is, was very non-Keynesian approach, uh, right? I mean, at any time, <laughs> and especially it was very well understood at that time. Uh, however, the, the monetary policy was relaxed, even if it turned out to be temporary, the interest rates were briefly cut by 2% on this budget. So the government tried to balance what it does on fiscal side with what it does on the monetary policy side. Uh, and that was, uh, yeah, uh, an approach that didn't last for long, but generally the government had stuck with fiscal and monetary policy trying to push in the same direction from 1980s. So interest rates, after all, remained high to, to try to quash inflation, while fiscal policy also tried to follow a certain government agenda. Uh, so I think, you know, if we see these lessons already learned to a large extent during the COVID crisis that uh, the Bank of England uh, by undertaking huge asset purchases, which we know as QE, quantitative easing, uh, it played a big role in helping the government to keep the interest uh, rates on, on its own debt uh, low. And that supported government to a large extent in, in responding to, to this uh, crisis of such a massive fiscal intervention without 
seek any real increase in the cost of the debt. So that, that, that shows us that there is a power, but I mean, there, there needs to be also some longer term strategy. And that's, I think, the big question for this government. So, I mean, we know at the high level, leveling up is meant to be the strategy. Uh, and if, I, if I'm coming to a conclusion, if, if I'm running out of time. So, so yeah, it's a big question. What this government actually wants to do? Uh, and does it have determination to, to do that? Uh, but uh, the further challenge that we face now that was not understood and was not so evident back then is uh, also the environmental challenge, the, the climate change challenge. So the government currently has a legally binding net zero target, uh, you know, backed up by science, backed up by multiple international reports that, you know, UK, as every country, needs to aim for reducing emissions in the next three decades. And uh, uh, that will need some government support. It doesn't mean it may need to cost government much uh, at all in the long run, because the cost of inaction will be far greater, as to the government's own Office for Budget Responsibility has uh, outlined its recent forecasts. But that, that seems to be like what should become this government's strategy. So it needs to be a strategy for net zero and strategy for reducing uh, inequality at the same time, uh, using the, the, the well-designed coordination of fiscal and monetary policies. Uh, so I think the lesson from 1981 budget is, you know, if you have a strategy and you have determination, you, you can probably do it. But so that's maybe the positive lesson of what we said in the 1980s. But also there is a warning that, you know, the, you need to, to keep the, the human aspect of your policies in mind. Uh, I don't think that the costs in terms of unemployment was acceptable then. I don't think something similar would be acceptable now or other costs in terms of squeeze on living standards and, and so on. So the government needs to be very, very mindful uh, that this policy doesn't deliver just for, for its winning electoral majority, although politics naturally pushes in that direction. Uh, but if the government was to really level up the country, it, it needs to take into account that it needs to work across the regions and across the big majority of, of uh, population uh, in delivering those goals. So I think, yeah, that's the, the other uh, lesson. And how I am with time, Emma, I may be... <laughs> Well, Kaj, thank you very much. I think we'll be coming, we'll be revisiting a lot of these themes in the Q&A. So thank you very much for your uh, you. preliminary thoughts. Um, I will open this up for questions at the moment. I don't think we have any just yet. And I, I'm sure that you would also like to respond to each other. But could I uh, just pose a question whilst we're waiting for some to come in? I'm, I'm quite interested that a key difference between now and 1981 is the ease of selling government debt um, now compared with 1981. Um, we had an oversubscription of those um, green gilts recently, um, you, you know, compared with the gilt edge strikes of the 70s and the early 80s. Um, and therefore the government now seems to me to be less exposed um, than, than perhaps the Thatcher government was. And I'd be really interested to know what, um, Lukács, what you think about that and, and, um, and Tim as well, um, your perspective. And I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that Jim has one. Yep, sure, should I make a start then? Thanks so much. Please, yes. Yeah, I think you make a valid point, and that's something that is the case not just for the UK, but for, for most developed governments, so like from the 1980s and into the 1990s, like there was always this fear of bond vigilantes, like, you know, the governments were held ransom by the, the, the debt markets, by the bond markets, and that there was this belief, at least, of perception that uh, they need to, to react what was happening. But it seems nowadays, you know, the, 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 the central banks have discovered or like, you know, working in coordination with governments have found this power that they can actually, to a large extent, uh, steer uh, those capital markets. And I think, you know, the, the main thing that may be driving why this, this, this happened, so it's not just because the government and central banks decided they would like it that way. I think they always would want it this to be that way. But I think the changes in the global economy that, you know, there is a lot of capital that is looking for the so-called safe assets. So the assets that they expect they will retain most of their value in times of crisis. So like the US dollar assets typically tend to be those, but also assets of other rich countries. So like sterling assets, euro-denominated assets are seen as such. 
and especially government guaranteed assets. So types of crisis, uh, this money is flowing in. Uh, and I think in the global economy, yeah, that, that there is this perception that perhaps there is lack of, of good investment opportunities and the capital just, just wants to, 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 to be backed up by, by those assets. So the governments kind of always have this queue of investors that want to pack money in, in those government guaranteed bonds for one reason or another. Uh, and yeah, that gives the governments and the central banks much more power in, uh, or at least much, much less fear what may happen in their debt interest. And I would say, obviously, that doesn't apply to all countries to the same extent. It applies to the US mostly as a you know, pre every global economy, other strong economies like UK, Germany, and so on. The case is completely different for like developing countries, and that creates a lot of debt injustice and inequality in the financial market. But yeah, I agree with your point on this a big, big shift. Thank you. And Tim, I'm sure you have a perspective on this, um, not least for having been a stockbroker of, at the time. Yes, indeed. Um, I started working in the City of London in October 1976. And at that time, the yield on long dated government debt was over 16%. There had, in fact, been, um, before I started, there'd been uh, in, in the city, there'd been um, a yield on a Piece of paper called the consolidated, uh, I think it was two and a half percent, the consoles, which in fact has a history going back to the 18th century. And um, the yield on this piece of paper was 17 percent, and the price was 15 pence. It, it was issued at 100 pence. I worked out uh, a year or two back how much anybody, how much people had lost in real terms if they bought consoles in 1946, this is just after Britain has won the Second World War and all that kind of stuff. And uh, between 19 and 30 years up to 1974, 75, they lost in real terms 97% of their investment. And obviously in this context, um, if you're gonna buy British government debt, you need some persuading. And um, the, Problem was that um, if people were, you know, free to choose to use Milton Friedman's race, they wouldn't want this paper because of the record of the government who engineered, quite honestly, and much of it was deliberate, uh, engineered the uh, uh, cheating of, of of the saver. That was why, through the 1980s, the governments had to offer positive real rate of return um, on government bonds to sell the debt. And that was also one of the reasons why the 1981 budget was necessary. You wonder why things are different today. Uh, and uh, I wonder about this too. I would say that it's partly because of the kind of buyers that we have, and I've mentioned three points. One point is that one of the big buyers, well, biggest buyer of government debt in the last couple of years has in fact been the Bank of England. Uh, and um, the, they don't, obviously they work with the government uh, and, and they don't want to be paying a high rate of interest on the government debt. And so that's, that's one reason. You then get into a discussion about quantitative easing and so on, and I'd, I'd welcome that discussion. The second point is that there are indeed, um, as Wujak has, has mentioned, we should mention the, 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 the um, international investors, including managers of foreign exchange reserves. Uh, and I've mentioned here, for example, the Chinese foreign exchange reserves. I don't understand their behavior. Um, I mean, the Chinese have got phenomenal foreign exchange reserves on which they're being, they're like, like the people who owned consoles and British government debt in the 50s and 60s, they're gonna be cheated. It's obvious they're gonna be cheated. They didn't understand that they shouldn't have trillions of dollars of foreign exchange reserves, stupid of them. And they shouldn't hold lots of guilt either, it's crazy. Um, the final reason is, uh, is regulation. It, it, it remains true that um, the kind of institutions I advised as a stockbroker in the 1980s, the insurance companies and the pension funds, they're still around, they still buy government debt. In those days, they didn't have to. They weren't forced to buy lots of government debt. And one of the things that they did in that period was to move into equities to protect against inflation. And they were free to do that. Since the mid 1990s, um, the, both the life insurance sector and the pension fund industry have been much more subject to regulation. Uh, and nowadays they're required to hold 
um, much higher proportions of government securities in the assets, supposedly for the safety of their investors, if you please. So they are forced to buy government bonds. And the government organized some inflation, they are cheated. They can't get out of it because of regulation. You must understand, I hope people you know, listening to this understand a bit more about what's motivating, being which motiv motivated the politicians of the Thatcher period. We believed in personal freedom, we believed in respect for private property, and we were appalled by what had happened to Britain in the 30 years to the mid-1970s. Thank you. Uh, Jim, did you want to comment um, on this? Uh, only briefly, I mean, it's a very interesting um, point to make. I just make perhaps uh, the point about the, um, the guilt strikes, which you mentioned, Emma, and the whole question about um, how far those constrained policy, which I think is, 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 a, is an issue which I've been interested uh, 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 in the past. But there is some um, um, interesting work done on that um, by a woman economist whose name at the moment I can't remember, who did a sort of international comparative study about under what conditions it seemed that um, debt sales acted to, to uh, constrain uh, national government's macroeconomic policies. Um, and she found it was only under very particular conditions and that, and that the idea that this was a sort of very large constraint uh, on this kind of uh, national economic policy was not really the case. And, and, and unsurprisingly, she found it was only when there was either the actuality or threat of very high inflation and or the actuality of the threat or perceived threat of, of runaway uh, uh, debts that, that uh, this became a problem which then constrained uh, national governments. And I think in, in that sense, as, as, as Luke actually has been pointed out, um, that's one place we're not uh, today for, for whatever reasons. And it may be, you know, it's to do with uh, all sorts of uh, irrationalities. Uh, it may be the Chinese, you know, foreign exchange policy is bizarre. But in any event, at the moment, this doesn't seem to be a problem uh, that, we, that we need to worry ourselves about. Thank you. Um, so I have a question from uh, Simon. Uh, Straight, sir. When we put uh, into the balances the benefit and costs of post-1979 targeting of inflation versus unemployment, what about the long-term costs to society and the economy due to child poverty? This rose from 15% in 1980 to 34% by 1990, according to the official measure, and it has been stuck at around 30% ever since. Can levelling up mean anything without evidence of serious policy to reduce child poverty back to 15% over the next decade? If so, what must such policies look like and how are they to be funded? Who would like to um, consider this? Well, I, I, could I just come in? Um, I mean, I think it's a very powerful question. I would say, though, that, um, that I think the premise, which I think Simon was putting, that, that, that uh, what the, the acceleration of child poverty and, and other measures of um, social uh, uh, ill welfare uh, are not all to do with unemployment, of course. Uh, that well, obviously one of the themes um, which I'm keen to emphasize in relation to what's happened to Britain over the last uh, 50 or so years is 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 the rise of uh, is deindustrialization, uh, which which has had very profound effects uh, on uh, the distribution of uh, income and uh, uh, welfare, and and that's a, a reason why I think although I think the 1981 debate is you know interesting and in some respects important, it, it, it's very hard to uh, to to make too direct a connection because the context is. Uh, uh, so different. I mean, I, 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 I don't think that the uh, uh, unemployment can be seen um, as such a key part of uh, uh, social harm um, today uh, as it as it was in this period. Not because unemployment doesn't produce social harm, but a lot more is coming from other other 
forces, particularly uh, deterioration in, in the labour market, affecting people who are not unemployed, but have low paid precarious work. Should I add something to what Jim was saying? Can I say, yeah, yeah, I think very, very good question. Uh, so yeah, maybe following directly from what Jim was saying here yeah, about the, the, the industrialization as one aspect of that resulted from 1980s policy. So I mean, one of the um, effects on the longer term development of labor market was not just unemployment and we were recovered by now from this uh, level of unemployment, but the type of jobs that people are able to get or parents said would be able to get. And nowadays, the, the, the proportion of jobs that are insecure in one way or another, so either lowly paid or, or zero hour contracts or short term contracts with not enough income, uh, has increased substantially. And I mean, I won't blame Jeffrey Howe for that directly. <laughs> we went through some policy circles, but like since 2008 crisis and then 2010 uh, austerity, that has been significant increase in this, this type of jobs. So then with those jobs, parents are likely to uh, have less security and less income and that uh, can lead to child poverty. But also in terms of there was a specific question of policy. So I mean, uh, the government welfare policy, uh, current government welfare policy has much to, to say for that. Like there are particular aspects for that that are pretty much designed to, to create child poverty, I would say. So for example, we have a, a two-child limit on, uh, on benefits under universal credit. So we have special elements uh, for your first child, for the second child, and, and no more. And I mean, uh, we, we did some modeling in the Economics Foundation that it can have some very substantial impact by being removing, for example, this two-child limit from the support the state provides to those on low incomes. And then there's the overall benefit cap that was kind of created to you know, create probably some headlines for the state, big tough on, you know, benefit lifestyle that supposedly is, you know, all luxurious and so on. <laughs> uh, while in reality, you know, it often tends to hit, hit parents as well, uh, because uh, uh, when you have more children, you have more needs, so you end up getting more support. But then because of the steel elements, you are not getting the support you need for, for the size of a family. So uh, reversing it, at least those two policies would be steps in that direction. If I may jump in, I, I mean, yes, I, please. I agree. And I think that thinking about this in a, um, uh, a very interconnected way is part of this. And as Jim says, this isn't just about unemployment. It's also about um, policies to do with um, education. It's to do with policies, um, kind of the gendering of some of this, uh, some of these policies and to do with, um, support for single parents um, and thinking particularly about um, social and care infrastructure. Um, Lukács was talking about, you know, the su support for parents and um, kind of different kinds of benefit caps and things like that, but also thinking about all of those other things that are contributing to certain types of um, child poverty, particularly around, say, like single motherhood um, and the extent to which having a greater care infrastructure and um, childcare support and um, I don't know, things like better lighting so that women can work, walk home late at night after a job, feeling safe and all of those things. It's a really integrated thing that is about more than just um, economics in that sense, but thinking about, um, yeah, women's safety and um, care for the elderly and all of those kind of things, which, work together in ways um, that then ultimately, it, it leveling up it involves leveling up everyone, right? It involves leveling up society as a whole and genuinely thinking about that as a whole and as an integrated way in that, um, yeah, it can't just be about a reduction to kind of, can we give certain people skills so that they can more effectively enter the marketplace? Yes, that's one part of it, but thinking like reducing this down just to economic imperatives, um, I think is somewhat of a mistake. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Tim, did you want to um, to comment on this? Um, I'm, I'm also thinking about, um, I know at the, uh, you're at the um, IEA and, you know, what sort of, um, how does, how do the right wing think tanks, you know, feel that they influence the current government for its levelling up agenda or not? Uh, maybe that's something you could um, speak to. Well, Emma, um, no, I, I'm, I'm a monetary economist, um, and, and the seminar, as I understand it, is about the 1981 budget. And obviously, um, I have views about 
the various topics we've been discussing in the last few minutes, but um, they're just, any, I don't have any special expertise in these areas. Um, I also have no, no role with the present government. They're not interested in the kind of things I'm interested in, and I, I have no role with, in the, with, with them at all. Um, I, I'm not a member of the Conservative Party, and uh, so just a bit clear about all that. I was in the period when Thatcher was 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 in uh, in office, but not now. Um, I think Amy used this word policies towards single parents. Is this phrase? Look, I'm very sorry, and I can't. We have different, we have different backgrounds, perhaps different attitudes, towards things. Uh, if you're a single parent, this is a result of choices that are made by I'm sorry by the mother. Uh, and um, then there are the consequences from these decisions. And obviously, and it affects their children, it affects maybe generations to come. And so, you know, if I, I, I used to talk to Margaret, that's not about this sort of thing very much, but to some extent about this sort of thing. And we both believe very strongly in personal responsibility. I'll say, I'll, I'll, end, I'll end there. This idea, it's policies, it's the government. No, it's not. It's the individual that must look after themselves. Um, Tim, whilst, uh, whilst we're talking to you, um, Duncan Needham has um, uh, put a question in the chat, um, which I think you would like to probably address. We know that Margaret Thatcher believed in a tight causal relationship um, from monetary growth to inflation. But yes. what about the real architect of the MTFS, uh, Nigel Lawson? Nigel Lawson wasn't the real architect of the MTFS, I was. Um, I wrote papers about this in the mid 70s, as Jim will know. And, and Nigel never really understood the monetary element in it, uh, which is why in the mid 80s, he dropped the broad money element, which then led to the Lawson boom and, and then the following bust. Um, the, I should, you know, I, I was working with other people, including uh, particularly Terry Burns at London Business School, who then became Chief Economic Advisor in 1980. Um, on this question of the link between money and inflation, there were very major policy changes in the early 80s. Um, one was the ending of exchange controls, um, which that was the uh, made uh, uh, selling again a kind of internationally respectable currency. There was the leap in interest rates, sure enough, largely motivated by the need to get monetary growth down, which meant that if you held money in a bank, you were getting a decent return again, so you'd hold more money in the bank. Uh, and then there's also fin financial liberalization, which actually Nigel Lawson was quite important in that, um, which meant that uh, the bank's more competitive. And again, that pushed up the rate of return on bank deposits and people held more bank deposits relative to income. So in the kind of years 1979 to 84-5, uh, money was rising, broad money, about 4% faster than nominal GDP. Let me immediately confess, I didn't foresee this. And so when one had recommended certain figures for the growth of broad money in the in the MTFS, these figures were too low. And that was a serious mistake, I, I confess that. Looking back, I think it was a good thing that the end of exchange controls, the uh, financial liberalization, that these things occurred. Um, and um, um, I, I, when one again looks at the relationship between the policies and the final objectives of policy, um, they were successful. Inflation did come down to 5%. Um, uh, there was then, of course, the Lawson boom and bust, but that's because Lawson actually abandoned, to me, a key part of the MTFS. Thank you, Tim. Jim, did you want to come in here? Well, just, just very briefly, I mean, I would say, I should have said the. Uh, so when I was talking that um, my perception and understanding of um, this period has been very much influenced by um, Duncan Needham's um, uh, writings about uh, monetary policy um, and also the, the very good book that he uh, co-edited uh, on the 1981 
uh, uh, budget, which is I think the, the standard as it were, the standard, the standard work on on, on that budget. Um, although, I, as I think I so hinted earlier, people who are interested in it should read the IEA uh, uh, pamphlet, uh, which which is also very interesting in in, in, in different ways. Um, as to um, peering into Nigel Lawson's soul, I'm not sure that I can add much. Um, I, I think you know the, the, the whole problem comes down in one sense to a tight causal relationship. Uh, that there is some relationship is obviously you know everybody uh, um, believe that uh, everybody involved clearly with the, the design of policy in the 70s and 80s in conservative circles believe that. But how did you actually turn that into um, a, a kind of a, a detailed uh, policy um, agenda? That was that was the, that was the problem. Um, and I see what we got in my perception was was a period of experimentation um, where clearly different things were tried, um, um, and none of them none of them worked very well. Uh, obviously, I. On that, disagree uh, with, with Tim about about the uh, targeting of Sterling M3. Um, that was perceived to have failed clearly by the mid '80s. It was given up. Another experiment was tried, um, and you know, policy then evolved eventually to where we got to with a with a um, an inflation target um, uh, where the, the Bank of England was given discretion um, as to um, how it. Uh, uh, how it achieved that target, which is which is roughly where we were before before COVID struck. And you think that's that's in my mind actually um, a positive thing in the sense that um, the, 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 the the there wasn't a, a commitment uh, which was stuck to uh, to Sterling M three, um, but there was. You know, for good political reasons, a willingness to experiment and try and find other ways of dealing with, as I say, this world which was which was so very different from the um, uh, the world prior to the breakup of Britain Woods. Could I come in there, Emma? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, again, let's just get this in perspective. At nineteen seventies, there was twenty seven percent inflation, collapse in the pound rising debt interest bills and all this kind of stuff. You say that the policies failed. No, they didn't. Inflation came down to 5%. And basically, the system was working fine. And um, I, I was this idea that sterling M3 was meaningless that I heard in 1984 and 85. Bank deposits can never be meaningless. You know, every company has run off its bank account, basically. Um, the It's absolutely true, Jim, that the MTFS, the monetary aspects, were dropped in 1985 and 86. What then happened? Money growth accelerated by inflation. Inflation increased. The important thing, and can I just say this as a slightly unfriendly note, Jim, which is that, look, some things are true. It just is true. If you have explosive growth of money, you'll get inflation. Those on the left to try and deny this. Look at what's going to happen to the, the present Democrat government of the United States. They have the, last year under Donald Trump, the Federal Reserve organized a fantastic surge in money, which I, I noticed criticized at the time and so on. Money growth uh, in the year to June uh, 2020 in the USA was 26%. That will blight the Biden presidency. You just watch the inflation rates taking off now. There'll be a recession in 2023. These things matter. And um, you know the whole point about what I advocated in the 1970s and I still believe in very much is stability in financial policy, meaning stable and low growth, the quantity of money and strong public finances. I'm not apologizing at all and basically it succeeded. None of this basic framework was thrown out by the Blair government, none of it. And can I just also say, Jim, deindustrialization was greater, greater uh, under, under Tony Blair than under, under Maggie Thatcher, much greater. Right. Okay, so if I just briefly respond, I said two bits. I mean, uh, 
certainly I, I would not claim, and I don't think many people on the left would claim that explosive inflation is something one shouldn't worry about. Um, and indeed, the inflation of the 1970s, which is not explosive, but certainly obviously high by peacetime standards of the mid 20s, percent is something which which the Labour government did address uh, and, and did bring down. So it's not as if the, the history of Labour governments is a disregard uh, for, for inflation. Obviously, they did that uh, uh, in a way which tried to minimise its impact on, on, on unemployment. And as I said, my perception is they had a, had a degree of success in achieving that, despite all the political humili humiliations and so on, whereas their successors uh, succeeded in reducing inflation, but at a very large cost. So that's how I see it. I mean, I think on the question of deindustrialization, uh, uh, I agree entirely that if you look at the numbers, uh, deindustrialization um, has been a, pers a persistent feature of Britain, indeed, going back uh, to the 1960s. Um, it, it didn't start under Thatcher. It ex certainly accelerated under Thatcher, but it certainly didn't start. I think what, what I would argue is distinctive about Thatcher and um, deindustrialization is that previous governments, uh, most notably uh, Harold Wilson's government uh, in, in the 60s, which was when deindustrialization in Britain actually really accelerates. I mean, the number of, number of people who lose their jobs in coal mining is much higher under Howard Wilson than under Margaret Thatcher. Um, uh, the the, the uh, difference uh, after 79 is that uh, up until then, there'd been an attempt with varying degrees of success to negotiate the consequences of that deindustrialization by, for example, and obviously coal mining is, is, is the best example, by negotiating with the unions about uh, uh, finding alternative jobs, about, about having regional policies to try and cushion the effect by bringing other industry into coal mining areas as coal mining jobs disappeared. So it's not that Thatcher started deindustrialization, of course she didn't. Uh, it's been a very long standing process process in Britain as indeed to varying degrees in, in, in fact almost all countries. <laughs> Today even China is deindustrializing uh, in terms of the proportion of the workforce uh, in, in, in industry. Uh, it's how you deal with that uh, that seems to be the crucial political question. Uh, and there I do see a difference between what happened before and after 79. Okay, well, thank I, I, Can I want to come in or, or, or should I leave it to you? Perhaps I don't want to dominate the discussion. Um, well, perhaps we but Just very, very quickly, yeah. I'm not sure that one should just decide, to, you know, is deindustrialization a problem? Is it necessarily a problem? I would say if um, there are, I'm going to use the expression, market forces that mean that that uh, the services sector of, the, of, the, of output is, is rising faster than, than industrial sector, so, so what? As it happens, Britain seems to be most successful in international business services you know, relative to many other countries. And so at, at the moment, um, international business exports, I think something like 10% of GDP. And it's that growth uh, of the, the, those exports, which are much lower, I mean, more like 1% or less of GDP in 1950, that explains a large part of what's happened in, in, in terms of the different sectors of the economy. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know how far we want to get into deindustrialization. We're getting well, I'm yeah. going to suggest, I think, that we could do a very interesting podcast on deindustrialization as a whole uh, different topic, and it'd be very interesting to hear your uh, perspectives. That, um, and I should say that um, that question, which uh, which arose initially from um, Duncan Needham's question, uh, he did qualify um, Nigel Lawson being the political architect. Um, but thank you both for um, for the, for for that um, those contributions. I'd like to um, turn to Amy, if I may, um, an anonymous question here in the Q and A. Um, thanking all the speakers, but saying that they would be uh, really interested in listening to some of your thoughts, Amy, about changes over the century that meant that by 1979, the cultural terrain for privatisation and investment culture was present for the government to build on. And you've already talked about the, sort of the longer history, but that would be great to hear um, you address yeah. that one. <laughs> 
Yeah, for sure. And thanks. Um, well, I would say this, but a great question. Um, it's right up my alley. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I could talk about a whole uh, array of different things. I guess it might be useful just to take one example. So um, the financial press, um, for example, over the course of um, kind of from the railway boom um, in the mid 1800s, um, you see the emergence of a financial press um, and it goes through a series of changes over the course of the century um, whereby it becomes more and more or certain aspects of the financial press become more interested in courting and encouraging a readership um, of small investors. And um, I guess there are kind of different manifestations of this um, kind of more traditionally the financial press has kind of sitting investment pages which are quite can be quite technical um, and are quite focused on people with a certain degree of expert knowledge. But you see emerging over the course of the 20th century pages which are more interested in kind of city gossip um, and things that are designed to be more human interest stories that are also going to um, encourage a more general readership. Um, and I think a real turning point in this is actually in the 19, um, kind of late 1950s, 1960s, when you head into a period of mass affluence, um, or kind of broadly speaking, mass affluence. And you see the financial press, um, well, you see the press in general start to kind of change who it's aiming, um, it's different um, sections that you see a real growth in kind of uh, consumer reporting and sections of the financial press start to mirror this um, and become really uh, much more interested in a general purpose audience um, and really curating and encouraging um, readers to find out more about not just investing um, but all sorts of um, different aspects of financial life and financial management and personal money management um, and I would say there's a kind of break off so you have the sitting investment pages and then you have um, something that I would kind of call money pages. Um, Dylan Porter has written about this really great interesting stuff. Um, Kieran Heinemann too has um, a book out recently that's all about um, the growth of like a speculation economy as well. Um, sorry, a, a more speculative fun gambling side or narratives around investing in popular culture, um, which then make it again more part of the mainstream. So there's um, something called investor pools, which emerges um, in kind of like the 1970s, which is a form of allowing people to just bet um, a bit like the football pools and pick different stocks and send off a coupon and kind of bet without a bet on the market without actually having to buy shares. So there's lots of little things like that, that then by the time you get to the 1980s, you have a really well established um, kind of sections of the financial press that are very well set up for talking to the every man and woman so that when you start um, you, there's like the perfect readership in place for those big privatization ads um, so I'm not saying that the 1980s wasn't a turning point it's a rapid acceleration um, but there is this kind of more general popular culture around investing that um, emerges over a much longer period I would say. Sorry, I've kind of gone off on one there, um, folks. Um, something that I'm kind of passionate about. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's so interesting. And I wondered if Tim had any comments on this uh, because um, I know that you were with uh, one of the papers for a while. Is this something that you um, um, uh, report? I didn't give share tips. Um, <laughs> yeah. I did say things about um, economic policy and monetary policy, but I didn't give share tips. Um, I'm not, again, quite sure what all this has really has to do with the Thatcher government and the 81 budget, but can I just say, as far as Thatcher herself was concerned, the first speech she gave as an MP was actually denouncing city speculation. Uh, and she had nothing to do, contrary to many myths, where the newspapers reported this um, after her death was, was absurd. Um, she had nothing to do with the big bang in the city of London in 1986. The Big Bang arose from a reference to the OFT by the, by the Trade Unions uh, Congress. And uh, this wasn't something that uh, Thatcher had designed or intended to push through at all. So there's many, many confusions about all these, this, these, these, these things. Um, I suppose later in life, as she became wealthier, she was probably more sort of tolerant of the city than she had been uh, you know, as, as, as a young lady, as a young woman, but um, she, she wasn't in any sense. Uh, but the 1986 Financial Services Act was pushed through partly because Thatcher was worried that in the next general election, um, the Conservatives would be tarred with the brush of, of friends of the city of London. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a question from uh, John Newham, who asks the panel, uh, was there more continuity in the fiscal policy of the Labour government after 1976 and its Conservative successor than the respective politicians would publicly acknowledge? Um, Jim, do you want to uh, start us with that? Well, Jim and I will probably have different sorts of view, and it's possibly not. I mean, the, I would, haven't got the figures for the PSPR GDP ratio in my head, but I think in 1974 it was 12% of GDP, something like that. Um, and um, so then for years to come, getting this down was an issue. Okay, getting this, this is a budget deficit as then measured. And the, I would say, Jim may agree with this, I'm not sure, that the really big turning point was not 79 or 81, it was 76. I mean, it was 76 when you had, first of all, the announcement of money supply target, July 76. And then two, you had the IMF um, letter of intent uh, in the autumn, which actually I had to comment on. My first thing as a, an economist in a stock in, in the in stockbrokers was that. And um, that was really the, 1976 was the, was the real um, watershed between the sort of, I don't actually agree the period before 76 was very clearly Keynesian, but between the period that economists see as Keynesian and the period when, if you like, monetarism was, was uh, important for a period. Well, I, mean, I, I don't disagree uh, broadly with, with, with what Tim says. I, I would say, <clears throat> I would, Put the turning point really in seventy five. I think I think Healy's budget of seventy five, um, where he makes this very public announcement about you know despite all the appeals of his uh, Labour colleagues, he can't prioritise uh, reducing unemployment because of the uh, the extent to which the government is borrowing. Uh, I think you know certainly in terms of sort of public statements, that I think to me is 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 the turning point in in uh, in, in seventy five. Uh, uh, and then obviously that's then reinforced as, 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 as Tim was talking about what happened thereafter. But I would I would say I'll just push it a bit a bit a bit earlier, uh, uh, and not uh, as I think um, is often said, only changes with the IMF. I mean the changes are well in train before the before the IMF uh, uh, gets involved, and in fact. The, the role of the IMF is, in a sense, to give a, a seal of approval to policies uh, which, 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 the, which the Labour government uh, has, has after lots of fighting. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree at all. I mean, I remember, you know, Gerald Barnett was clearly, he really meant, meant to get public spend. He was um, Chief Secretary in, in that period. And even before the IMF was there, he meant to get public spending down. Well, we seem to have got a note of agreement. That's sort of. <laughs> well, I'm done. I mean, there. I'm sure there have been nuances, and, and, and obviously we have different, probably different views about. But, but I think you probably can see what it was that if you wish, you know, what the monetarists were trying to do. I mean, I, I'm sure you don't think there are there are other things and other things could have been done. I think what, just again, this may be interest to other people listening. You know, in the 1981 letter, it was said other policies were available. They weren't spelt out in the 81 letter. Can I just sort of, maybe this is a caricature, but essentially it was fiscal policies, fiscal inflation to, in, to increase employment and reduce unemployment, and then price and incomes policies to keep inflation down. That was the real alternative that was being given by the National Institute and others at the time. And I'm sorry, they had been totally discredited by the experience um, of, of the 1970s. You know, we had um, the, the miners' strike in 70, was it, I think it was 74. Then we had another one, of course, in 84. And these were very important events at the time because of the, um, the question of whether inflation be brought down control by, by effectively government controlling individual prices and wages, whether it should be done by monetary policy was a very important subject. And um, it's tended to be forgotten. Um, this was in some sense part of the sort of wider freedom agenda that, that monetary policy meant that you didn't have to have 
this intervention, individual prices and wages, and this constant bargaining with trade unions. Um, what interesting about one aspect of that is, I mean, Geoffrey Howe, um, certainly in opposition um, before, before the winter of discontent, was certainly interested in looking at ways of, of continuing, not incomes policies, but certainly kind of broad national negotiations about uh, inflation targets between employers and trade unions. So I think what, what it was not that um, uh, uh, that was uh, from the beginning regarded as, a, as a, an absurd road to, to go down. But obviously politically, once you'd had the winter of discontent, and once you'd had a particular political account by the Conservative Party of the winter of discontent, you're obviously right. There could be no going back because that had become you know, a, an absolute uh, a, a limit thing. Now, clearly, you know, that the state relied very much on the particular interpretation of the winter of discontent by the Conservatives as showing that, you know, any kind of uh, deals with trade unions were unworkable and that the whole trade union movement was out of control, blah, blah, blah. Whereas my reading of the winter of discontent is that it was the result of the Labour government being too ambitious in trying to reduce its uh, the growth of money wages. It, it bore particularly heavily, of course, on public sector workers where it could be made effective. And they, of course, were the ones who were mainly the, the people who went on strike in the winter of discontent. So to me, uh, it doesn't show that in all circumstances attempts to manage uh, uh, overall uh, wage bargaining in a context where you've got high inflation, you recognise that bringing that inflation down threatens uh, higher unemployment. Everybody, everybody accepted that, including, of course, monetarists. They took different views about how, how serious that problem that was and how, how you would manage it. Uh, but most people recognise that was a problem. Um, but the winter of discontent, as you rightly say, made that politically uh, impossible for, 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 for a Conservative government uh, to, to pursue any longer. Well, thank you. Um, I do think with that, that we will have to draw this fascinating discussion to a close. Um, I want to thank you so much to all our panellists for giving us their time and insights this evening and to everybody for coming and asking such um, probing and interesting questions. If you enjoyed tonight's event, please do come along to future Myland Institute panels. Um, as a reminder, you can keep up to date by signing up to our mailing list on our website, following us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Um, I mentioned the podcasts earlier and I, I do think there's scope here for further discussions. Um, a recording of this event will also be available on our YouTube channel in the morning. And in the meantime, have a good evening and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much. Very thanks a lot. Thank you.